Thanks for joining us today. At City Life, we have one purpose, making it easy for people to say yes to Jesus. We believe that today's message will empower you to do exactly that. But remember that church is so much more than a sermon you listen to. It's a living, breathing community that we invite you to be part of. We hope to see you this Sunday morning here at City Life. pleasure to have you here today. Uh, And I get to continue on this awesome series we've been on, God Cares About My What? Come on, you guys, everybody do it with me. God cares about my what? It's sometimes fun to pretend to be like a teenage girl. I don't know. Yeah. Huh? What? (laughs) I don't know. Me just being silly. So throughout this series, we've been tackling the tough the awkward, the odd, and, uh, you know, we don't really shy away from the tough topics around here, although I like to delegate them to other people. It's harder when it actually is one that you need to speak on. Those are harder, Uh, but so today I want to talk about God cares about our doubts and our questions, because I do believe that God cares about what we wonder about. We wonder, you know, does God care? Is he real? It, does he like me? I think those are very real questions. And uh, as I was preparing for this message, message this week, my son actually, out of the blue, asked me a really big question. He said, how do we know that we're right about God? Ooh. It's a big question. And, you know, I felt like I know my answer. I feel like I've studied it and I've come to, uh, you know, a place where my belief that we are right about God. I feel like I know what I believe about this. However, it still rattled me a little bit because uh, he didn't need an apologist, you know, someone who um, is an expert at giving the reasons for our faith and explaining the why of what we believe. And he didn't need a theologian. He didn't need somebody with a master's degree in theology to give him the scriptures (laughs) that explain He just needed his mom and uh, needed somebody to talk to. You know, I think we all have questions like that, though. The questions that make us wonder. And I don't believe that God is insulted by our questions or our doubts, because I know that God has created us with this capacity to wonder, to question, to think deep thoughts, even from a young age. It was surprising that he asked me that. And I definitely don't claim to know all the answers, but I want to talk about uh, our doubts today because I think we need to be honest about our doubts. And if you're not a believer and you are here with us today, or maybe you're just undecided about God, we have a saying around here. We say, you can belong before you believe. And we truly stand by that. You don't have to believe everything I do in order to feel like you're part of the family around here. You can belong. And if you are a believer, I think we need to acknowledge where we are doubting through different seasons of our journey. And we need to let our doubts drive us to ask those questions and to ask them in a a humble way and an honest way because then I believe our doubts can actually build and develop a faith that will last. And you know, I don't know about you, but I get questions sometimes. And so I need to know what I believe and what my doubts are so that other people's doubts don't sway me or shake me in my belief and that I have a reason or an an explanation or a reason when others ask questions. So we're going to talk about doubt today. So we all have a frame of reference. We all have a way that we view the world, the way that we look at these questions through. And it's our frame of reference is shaped by our perspective and our upbringing, maybe our experiences. It's the w- and it's actually what we look through. It's the filter that shapes the way we ask and the way we wonder when we ask those big questions about God. And as a child, someone else shaped your frame of reference, right? Somebody else gave you their perspective. 
as a child. You know, we were all raised with a specific set uh, of, of beliefs, a specific set of um, a framework to look at the world through. Maybe you were raised with a specific religious framework or an intellectual framework or a moralistic framework. We were all given something and it was, our original frame was shaped by someone else. Right. And then as a teen, you know, yeah. as a teen we realized that we were smarter than our parents. <laughs> and we, you know, we realized that the, the framework that we were given as a child maybe wasn't complete or wasn't enough. And that's actually mostly a good thing, not the whole thinking you're, you're smarter than your parents, but outgrowing your childhood perspective. It is a good thing. You know, we realized that the frame we were raised with wasn't enough. And that's actually our brain developing the ability to see from others' perspectives, the ability to critically look at things and reason. And that's actually so good. And I'll give you an example. You know, your parents used to have to drive you to the dentist, maybe kicking and screaming. But now, come on, we're adults. We go to the dentist ourselves, right? We drive ourselves. And so our thinking on that particular topic has changed. So overall, our beliefs and our, our um, frame of reference grows and changes over time. But these perspectives really shape the way we doubt and wonder and think about God. And then there's just changing seasons in life, right? Life happens. We experience challenges. Yay! We love those. Uh, we experience tragedy, honestly. That does make us question God's goodness. And, it, and it's real. Or we experience failure. We make mistakes and we wonder, how could anybody love me? How could God actually love this? You know, we question and we wonder. Or maybe you experienced something that left you wondering. Maybe it was an article you read or some hypocrisy that you saw. And we wonder, you know, you know if God's real, can you prove it? Or we question his involvement. God, if you're powerful, why don't you do something? Right. You know, maybe some answers have been found along the way to our questions. But we have uh, maybe some doubts resolved, but it leads to more questions. So the question I have for us today is what do we do with the big mysteries in life? The things that our frame of reference doesn't fit you know, what do we do when there are just more questions and no matter how much you explore, you can't seem to find the answer? You know, I think we need to acknowledge that no matter how smart we are, no matter how religious we are, no matter how philosophical we are, no matter how hard we try or how diligently we search, there are things about God, the infinite God of the universe, that our finite brains just won't get that our finite frame of reference is not big enough to comprehend. And so we need to acknowledge that when it comes to big questions, whether it's intellectual doubts or spiritual doubts, that there is a way that we are looking at these questions through. And it will shape the way we deal with our doubt. So I don't believe that doubt is wrong. A doubt can actually be a really amazing catalyst in our life. And so we're going to look at how somebody in the Bible dealt with his doubt and Jesus' response to him. So John, uh, we often call him John the Baptist or John the Baptizer. It's not because he went to a Baptist church. It was because he actually was known for baptizing people and getting people ready to hear the message of Christ. And so we're going to look at how he handled his doubts. But most importantly, we're going to look at how Jesus responded to him because I find it very interesting. So John the Baptist made one of the earliest confessions of Christ. So he had a revelation of who Jesus was. Uh, in John 1, he said, look, there he is, God's lamb. He will take away the sins of the world. He knew that Jesus was important to God's plan. And then uh, a little, couple verses later, he says, And now I have seen with discernment, and I can tell you for sure that this man is the Son of God. That is a confident declaration of who Jesus is. And John the Baptist actually had that revelation. Now, John the Baptist was actually Jesus' cousin. I don't remember if I said that already. But. And when he was in his mother's womb, Elizabeth, his mother, 
Um, and Mary got together, Mary, the mother of Jesus, when Mary was pregnant with Jesus. And there's actually a scripture that talks about when Mary met Elizabeth, that John, who was in Elizabeth's womb, leapt. So from in the womb, he had a revelation of who Jesus was. He knew he was someone special. And then he proclaimed, he is the Lamb of God. He is the Son of God. Which this, from a Jewish perspective, answered the question, who is the Messiah? He understood um, that Jesus was the Messiah, sent from God to rescue and restore his people. But he had his own Jewish frame of reference. He had his own perspective that was shaped by their understanding of the scriptures and their questions about God. And, you know, they understood the Messiah to be a military hero, a king, a ruler, someone who would actually bring freedom to their people, a political ruler. And so he actually had that perspective that he thought or he knew he was the Messiah, but he thought the Messiah would fit in his brain. And so then life happened. And he ticked off the ruling king, Herod, and was thrown in prison. So John the Baptist is in prison. And we read this account in the, the book of Matthew, chapter 11. It says, now when John the baptizer was in prison, he heard about what Christ was doing among the people. So he sent his disciples or his followers to ask Jesus this question. Are you really the one prophesied to come or should we still wait for another? So he was confident that Jesus was the Messiah, but now he's encountering some challenges in his life and he starts to wonder. Now he's perplexed. You know, this is not how I expected things to happen. This is not how I expected... Uh, the Messiah to act. I expected something different. And so we started to question, and he, the uncertainty started to set in. So we set, sent his friends, and it says in verse 4, Jesus answered them, give John this report. The blind see again, the crippled walk, lepers are cured, the deaf hear, and the dead are raised back to life, and the poor and broken now hear the hope of salvation. And tell John that the blessing of heaven comes upon those who never lose their faith in me, no matter what happens. I really love the way that that, that um, sentence is worded in a different translation. Jesus said, blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. Blessed are people who don't stumble in their faith when their expectations of me are different than how I actually am. When your frame of reference is different than the way I actually am. You know, basically he was saying, John, you can't attach your faith to your expectations of me. How you thought I would act. How you thought I would come in to bring freedom and restore people. You know, I need you to look, not just through your frame and your understanding. I want you to look at the evidence of what I'm actually doing. Jesus gave him a new frame of reference. Don't look at your reference, look at me. Look at what I'm doing. And then Jesus sent the disciple, or John's disciples back to him with that answer. But within earshot, as they were leaving, Jesus said to the people who he was speaking with, throughout history, there has never been a man who surpasses John the baptizer. There has never been a man. He commended him. This is an amazing man. But where is he right now? He's in prison, struggling with his doubt and his uncertainty. He's unsure about Jesus. He hasn't heard his answer yet. The people have not brought the answer back to him. So in his doubt, when he's still struggling with his questions, Jesus said, there's nobody like John. From the moment John stepped onto the scene until now, the realm of heaven's kingdom is bursting forth, and passionate people have taken hold of his power. It's as, as if Jesus was saying, John may doubt me, but I don't doubt John. John is still my teammate. He is still my partner in bringing God's kingdom reality to earth. So then uh, in, the in the next portion of Matthew 11, Jesus actually begins to talk about some cities. He talks about the doubt in these cities. You know, Jesus said, said he did so many miracles, yet they did not believe. So he contrasts the doubt of John the Baptist, who he commended. He brought his doubt and his questions to me. But he actually condemned the cities. 
where he did so many miracles, yet the people still didn't believe. Jesus gave them all the proof they should ever need, yet they still didn't believe. You know, Jesus praised the doubt of John, who humbly came to, his, to Jesus with his questions, but condemned the cities that had all the, pri- or all the proof, but their pride kept them from believing. So it's not that doubt is right or wrong. It's what we do with our doubt that matters. So from the life of John, I want to look at how we should handle our doubts. First of all, admit your doubts and ask for help. You know, that's what John the Baptist did. He didn't just sit in his his cell all alone, depressed and wondering, and allow his doubts to take over and redefine the way he saw Jesus. He admitted his doubts to his followers, to the people who he was actually a leader for. He admitted his doubts to his followers and asked for their help. You know, I think we learn from John that it's okay to admit your doubts, even as a leader. You know, if leading a connect group has been intimidating for you because you think, I can't do that because I don't know how I would answer people's questions. We all have the things that we don't know how to answer. When, if God's called you to lead, you lead and we just, you figure it out. Even John the Baptist, you admit your doubts and then we figure it out together. Let's search. Let's go to Jesus with our questions and let's seek him together. You know, then they brought John's questions to Jesus and God isn't fragile. He can handle your doubts. He can handle your questions and your fears and your worries because he is a big God. So we need to tell him our doubts and ask for his help. You know, we can go to another Christian friend who is strong in their faith and ask them what they believe. Or there are some fantastic resources, some apologists uh, like um, Ravi Zacharias and Tim Keller and Lee Strobel that will give you the theologians and apologists response. I'm not that, but I can talk about the way we doubt. There are amazing resources out there if you are doubting, but this is the place we come. Doubters are welcome here. Church is the place we come with our doubts and our questions and our uncertainty. The next thing that John did is he doubted humbly. We come with our questions, but acknowledge that we are seeing things through our own limited perspective. You know, John the Baptist didn't know in advance how things were going to play out, but he asked, Are you really the one? This is what I thought you were going to do, but are you really the one? And then Jesus um, condemned the cities who were so proud that that no miracle was going to be enough to convince them, but he commended John for his humility, for those who come. And so Jesus says in uh, Matthew 11, 25, Jesus exclaimed, Father, thank you that you are Lord, the supreme ruler over heaven and earth, and you have hidden the great revelation of your authority from those who are proud and wise in their own eyes. Pride causes truth to be hidden. You know, this is what Jesus is saying here, that when we actually just have a hard heart and a proud attitude when we bring our doubt, that it actually causes the truth to be hidden from us. And then he goes on to say, instead, you have, um, Jesus saying to God, you have shared the revelation of your authority with those who humble themselves. Yes, Father, your plan delights your heart, and you have chosen this way to extend your kingdom by giving it to those who become like trusting children. You know, we don't have to check our brains and just turn our brains off in order to believe, but we do need to trust like kids. I know this next verse is a verse that I've heard many times, but I realize that it is actually in the context of doubt, where Jesus was contrasting the doubt of John the Baptist and the doubt of the cities that he judged. And then he said, Are you weary carrying a heavy burden? Then come to me, and I will refresh your life, for I am your oasis. Are your doubts heavy? Are they a heavy burden that's weighing on you? You know, we can search and try and figure it out, but that's a weight that we weren't meant to carry. We need to come to him, to come to Jesus with our doubts. He says, simply join your life with mine. Learn my ways and you will discover that I am gentle, humble, easy to please. You will find refreshment and rest in me for all that I require of you will be pleasant and easy to bear. And Jesus 
answered. I love this. He answered John the Baptist's questions. There are questions we can bring to God, and he will answer. And he needed what he, or he gave him what he needed to believe because he came in humility. And then Jesus' response to John's questions was actually, this is the evidence of my kingdom. These are the things that John had already experienced. He had already seen Jesus healing people. These weren't news to John. This was just reminding him, go back to what you know to be true. And this helped John reframe his frame of reference. You know, when we have those big questions that we don't know, go back to what we do know. What is the foundation of our faith? When we question and doubt, we can't attach our faith on the answers, uh, or sorry, we can't attach our faith to the church. It's not so secret. This is a room full of imperfect people, myself included. You can't fix your faith based on our behavior. Or we can't fix our faith to a specific version of Christianity that we're raised with. Or one that you've witnessed that labels people and excludes people. Or a version of Christianity that just disses science. You know, there's things that bother us about that, but we can't hinge our faith to that. We can't hinge our faith to getting all the answers to all the confusing stories in the Old Testament. There are a few (laughs) that are hard to understand. You know, our foundation can't be a version of faith that can't handle that bad things happen to good people. Because Jesus would say to that, you kidding? The worst possible thing happened to the best possible person who ever lived. He was crucified and he was completely sinless. He was the best person who ever lived and the worst possible thing happened to him. Where do we get the idea that bad things can happen to good people? Jesus showed us. It's just what happened. So we need to put away our own frame of reference or at least acknowledge that it's flawed and fix our eyes on Jesus. We can't look at everything through our frame. We need to fix our eyes on him our new frame of reference. Jesus came to answer some of our big questions. You know, to the Jewish people who had many questions, you know, what is life after death? What is the Messiah going to be? The the Jewish frame of reference had a lot of questions about God, but God didn't send all the answers down in a lecture. He sent a person. He didn't send down all the answers. He sent someone who could give us a whole new frame of reference so that when we look at Christ, the foundation of our faith is actually able to be very certain and very clear. So fix our eyes on Jesus. So what do we know? What do we know? There is evidence that we can go back to. So these are the two things that we know, not just from the Bible, but from history and from what scholars have studied and what people have uncovered. This is not just the Bible says so. This is actually what we can know from history. So scholars agree that Jesus was a historical person. We know this. Jesus really lived. And he really died on the cross. We know this. And then we also know that Within a few months or maybe a few short years, this was not lifetimes later for the the myth to grow and gain momentum. This was years, if not months, after Jesus was was crucified that the church started. So we have reliable eyewitness accounts from the Bible. These are not just stories. These were people who actually saw this, where Jesus claimed to be the Son of God, He claimed to reveal the Father to us. He then predicted his own death and resurrection and then pulled it off. He rose from the dead. And the main mystery that should, if you don't believe, this should should bug you. Because the disciples that followed Jesus, those men were uneducated fishermen and tax collectors. They were not scholars and, or even popular people. These were scared, confused, insecure guys. We see over and over throughout scripture where they ask dumb questions, (laughs) just being real, over and over and over again. These were not, uh, they, they were insecure guys. They were. 
And then they watched Jesus die the most shameful death. And then they walked into the same streets where people saw him die, where he was publicly crucified, saying Jesus rose from the dead. It wasn't what he taught. It wasn't what he said. They were changed by the, the evidence of his resurrection and what that meant for them. These guys changed from insecure, doubting people to the founders of our faith. Bold, fearless, proclaiming Jesus has risen, right. fixing their eyes on Jesus even to their death. And it started something world-changing. Wow. They knew it to be true. And Jesus gave them a whole new frame of reference. And so this is what I explained to my son when he asked me, how do we know that we're right about God? This is what I believe. I started with the evidence we have. Jesus was a real person. Jesus rose from the dead based on the eyewitness accounts, and it changed the world. And then I explained some of the simple differences I don't really have time to get into between different religions that some most religions in general tell us the way to earn our way to get God's approval. Whereas God didn't send the answers, he didn't send a how-to, he sent a person to reveal God the Father and his heart to us. There are things that we have questions about, but this is one thing God didn't want us to question. Yeah, it's really good. And we do have some exclusive beliefs. And so do other religions. We say we're right, but it's... the. <laughs> Faith in God, or faith in Jesus Christ, leads us to the most inclusive of communities where everyone is welcome, regardless of what you've done, what you believe, who you are, what your frame of reference is. We don't say that we're right just so we can say, we're right and you're wrong. Because Jesus didn't do that. Jesus is our frame of reference. Jesus loved people who hated him. Jesus forgave, forgave those who abused him. He served those who oppose him. And he included those who were nothing like him. We don't say we're right and you're wrong because we want to exclude people. <laughs> when we tell others about the reasons we have for our belief that Jesus is the Lord of all lords, we do it with gentleness and respect and humility. No one has, was ever argued into the faith. It just doesn't work. He served and he loved and he was humble and kind. And Jesus is a message for everyone. Jesus was sent from God to, to stand with us so that we don't have to un wonder where do we stand with God. If you have doubts, I encourage you, read the book of Luke. Study its claims. Look at the facts. And check out the, the message for yourself because you will discover the most amazing truth that Jesus loves us. And he did everything possible so that he could actually reconnect us with, the, with God, with the people he loves. He said, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. We can know what God is like. And this invitation is open to everyone, regardless of how we were raised, regardless of what we know or what we don't know, regardless of the pain that's caused us to doubt, regardless of what we've done and how unlovable we feel. Yes, Jesus loves us. We know that. And our Heavenly Father wanted this to be clear, so he sent a person. You know, there will always be things that make us wonder. Because I think God's wired us for mystery. We love a good mystery. We love to wonder and imagine. And that is something God has actually wired us to do. But there are things he doesn't want us to wonder about. He never wants us to wonder, what is God like? And where do I stand with God? And does God like me? Because he does. And the whole point of the accounts of Jesus' life in the Bible is to tell us that story. God became king on earth as it is in heaven. You know, God really has become king in and through Jesus. And there is a new state of affairs that he has started. A door has been opened that no one can shut. Jesus is now the world's rightful Lord. We're going to stand. Please stand with me. We're going to pray. And I acknowledge that sometimes it is an intellectual battle that keeps people from Christ. And I know I didn't answer a lot of questions today. Maybe I even started some. But the questions we should never wonder is, what is God like? Because Jesus showed us that. 
And does he like me? Because he died to show his love for each and every one of us. You know, sometimes we don't have all the answers. Actually, all the time, we don't have all the answers. But hopefully, you can get enough of your answers answers that you need to be able to put your faith in him. So if you're ready to say yes to Jesus, if you believe that he is who he claimed to be, the son of God, the Jewish Messiah, sent from heaven to show us what God is like, then the Bible says we can use our mouth to declare our belief in him and we will be brought into his team, onto his Uh, into partnership with God to bring his kingdom to earth as it is in heaven. That we will be rescued from everything that makes us selfish and self-focused and we can see the world through his eyes. And so we're gonna pray together in just a minute and I wanna invite you to pray along with us because it is such a powerful prayer that acknowledges that he is Lord and it can be the start of an absolutely amazing journey. Would you pray with me? Say, Jesus, Thank you. Thank you for sending Jesus to show us your heart and to make a way for us. Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God and that you have a purpose for me. Thank you that you lived and you died and you rose again so that I could have your new life. And I choose to be part of your big story and to put my faith and trust in you, even in the midst of doubt, because you are worthy of my trust. Thank you for your life and a brand new start today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, let's just thank him. We hope today's message encouraged you. If you want to take your next step in saying yes to Jesus, you can always contact us at cty.lc or fill out the next step section on the City Life app. It's an honor as a church to play just a small part in what God is doing in your life. And we look forward to seeing you soon here at City Life.